through and use that for uh, design optimization. Clearly, uh, this, has, um, this workflow has high mission relevance for uh, Livermore, but being able to uh, run their workflow on Sierra was not uh, without a challenge also. So specifically, they need to um, run lots of lots of data, um, co collect lots of lots of data to build a machine learning model. In fact, their initial uh, target was to run 1 billion uh, short run jobs. Think about that for a moment and what's going to happen if you submit 1 billion short running jobs um, into your uh, batch job scheduler. Um, I doubt that there will be a, a batch job scheduler that can handle that many jobs, but even if um, they can do that, so having that many jobs in your pending uh, job queue uh, can expose um, what akins to denial of service attack to other users who's using that um, uh, the scheduler. So in fact, about three years ago, uh, we went ahead and uh, surveyed uh, those emerging workflows, including uh, you know, those users who's using their own ad hoc uh, workflow scripts, while um, those users, um, you know, those workflows are from uh, different domains of science, we found that uh, about four distinct workflow challenges are being shared uh, by them. So I, I list them one by one. Um, the first challenge is a call scheduling. Just like you saw from the Mumi workflow, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the growing trend is to couple simulations different scales with uh, in situ analytics and machine learning. Um, being able to effectively co-schedule those components into allocation uh, was identified as a big challenge. And second one uh, was job throughput challenge. Um, just like you saw from the MLSI workflow, uh, large ensembles of short running jobs um, have become uh, more or less commonplace, and they found that the traditional resource manager and scheduler with centralized architecture, um, you know, don't really provide the requisite performance and scalability. And third one is job communication and coordination. Uh, jobs in either at a couple simulations or ensemble simulations uh, often require close coordination with the schedulers um, and also amongst themselves. Uh, but the Users found that the, uh, um, the traditional approach don't provide necessary API and one that they can use to uh, do this meaningful coordination and communication. And finally, uh, there's a good old portability challenge. Users want to write their um, you know, core logic once um, and then be able to run that across uh, systems with uh, uh, different batch systems. Uh, but each system comes with different syntax and semantics and maintaining uh, that complexity in and of itself uh, can be a heroic effort. And, our users identify that as a, a big challenge as well. So we uh, set out to solve um, each and all, all of the challenges that I talked about using Flux. Uh, be before uh, getting into some of the technical details, um, I thought it makes sense to introduce you um, the general uh, status of Flux, um, uh, especially those who haven't heard about it. Um, so Flux is a large uh, open source project uh, that is in active development um, at GitHub. And uh, looking at the, some of the early uh, code commits, um, they are uh, you know, dated back to 2013, so it's almost like seven years now. And to manage the complexity associated with a large project like uh, Flux, we have uh, our GitHub organization called um, Flux Framework. And then um, we separate out different components of Flux um, as a separate uh, project repo under that organization. So for example, um, the core framework and core services are in a uh, Flux core repo and our uh, Fluxion graph scheduler uh, is in Fluxcat and so on and so forth. And then we do um, the pretty rigorous CI testing uh, within each project as well as across, uh, across those projects to ensure uh, the insurance. And um, so our development is quite active at this point. In fact, uh, when I looked at it, we have about um, over 15 uh, contributors actively contributing to um, our project, uh, making commits uh, almost you know daily basis, and uh, some of them actually include uh, the very uh, principal uh, software developers who are behind the design and development of Slurm itself, uh, and then applying lessons learned from uh, Slurm development um, into the design and implementation of Flux. So in terms of the the growth of our code base, um, Flux has two mode of operations. One is uh, what we call single user mode, uh, whereby a individual user can instantiate a Flux instance and use it as an individualized uh, resource manager and scheduler. And we mature uh, that functionality first, 
And then that has been used in production uh, for about uh, three years now. And then a lot of things that I'm going to talk about is actually the, um, the single user mode. And then we do have a multi-user mode. Um, in addition to the single user mode, we added um, securities and uh, resiliency and things like that. And then, um, you know, that mode is having its debut on uh, Livermore's Linux clusters. So we're going to uh, incrementally uh, replace Slurm on uh, Linux systems using that. And uh, our planner record for um, resource manager and scheduler on, you know, Livermore's El Capitan system is also Flux. <laughs> so, and, and we use this Flux to solve uh, each and um, every workflow challenge that um, I presented, kind of circling back to our challenge. Uh, and if I have to say only one core capability that allows Flux to address the, the problems uh, previously mentioned, that would be uh, Flux's ability to be nested um, within a resource allocation. So um, the resource allocation uh, can be created by Flux itself. If the facility like uh, LC or NERSC uses it as the system um, level scheduler, uh, or the allocation, you know, al uh, resource allocation can be created by other uh, batch systems as uh, resource manager like Slurm and LSF. So what it means is that um, users don't need to wait for the facility to, um, to adopt and uh, deploy Flux as the system resource manager uh, to benefit from it um, because it takes you know, a lot of effort to, um, for the facility uh, to be able to do that. And then um, uh, once you get a, a resource allocation, you can um, instantiate your personalized Flux instance or generally speaking, a hierarchy of Flux instances like this and then you can customize uh, Flux instances tailored to the uh, performance characteristics of your workloads. Um, and uh, the hierarchy of Flux instances uh, expose and rich and well-defined interfaces. Uh, and then that actually facilitates uh, meaningful uh, communications and coordination with the, uh, the workflows running on uh, running under this Flux. And then we um, call this scheduling model, generalized multi-level scheduling model, uh, to differentiate us from uh, more well-known uh, scheduling models such as centralized scheduling and um, limited hierarchical scheduling. So Flux is architected specifically to embody the uh, generalized multi-level scheduling model that I talked about. So on the left, uh, we have uh, Flux's architectural diagram. And in, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to just highlight only four uh, distinct features uh, of Flux pertaining to our subject here. So uh, you notice that uh, Flux is a uh, software framework and then a software framework is underpinned by a scalable tree-based communication overlay network. Um, in fact, a Flux instance um, is a complete instantiation of uh, this communication overlay network along with the service modules that's um, uh, uh, loaded into uh, this framework. So that gets to our second point. Um, the, uh, many of the core services of Flux are uh, written uh, as dynamically loadable uh, service modules like this. Um, and then, uh, you know, they are, um, you know, providing their own uh, service implementation, but they do uh, make use of scalable communication uh, idioms such as uh, PopSub or um, RPC that this uh, communication overlay network provides. And then each Flux instance, which is a third point, can spawn uh, one or more child instances, um, which is also a complete instantiation of the overlay network along with the service modules. And then our fourth point is that um, the, uh, a, a child um, can easily specialize its services by loading in those service modules with a different param parameters, for example, or um, use a different module that implement the same service. So swap in and out. Um, and then using that architecture as our uh, basic building block, we uh, use four distinct uh, techniques, each of which map to uh, four different workflow challenges that I was talking about. So I'm gonna just take, take a, a deeper dive um, into each of those techniques. So uh, scheduler specialization um, maps to the scheduling co-scheduling challenge that I was talking about. So when it comes to scheduling policy specialization, the traditional batch job schedulers uh, don't offer much uh, in this space. Uh, each site 
typically um, enforce one schedule of policy like conservative backfill for all jobs and that's it. They don't support users to use this same scheduler to schedule uh, their uh, tasks and let alone uh, allowing them to change the policies um, to, you know, to uh, tailor to uh, their performance, the performance characteristics of uh, their workloads. By contrast, uh, Flux enables both system and user level scheduling under the same common infrastructure and interfaces. What I mean by that, so um, users will use the same Flux commands and interfaces that sysadmin will use to enable batch batch jobs. So you don't have to use a separate library or separate, uh, you know, separate packages to uh, utilize that. You can just use the same uh, interfaces. And then Flux gives users uh, a lot of freedom to adapt their uh, scheduler instances. Um, so, um, uh, so specifically, they can change uh, queuing policies and resource match policies and hierarchical policies tailored to their uh, workload. And uh, here is uh, just one uh, simple example. So um, uh, in this case, users are running uh, a Flux instance under Slurm. So you get an allocation from Slurm like this, and then you start uh, Flux using Flux start, but um, using the native S run to uh, instantiate it. Uh, typically, uh, um, the default scheduling policy here is first come first serve, but uh, they can be um, you know, easily altered by setting an environment variable like this um, and then set that to uh, easy backfill uh, capable scheduling. Uh, there are other ways you can actually specialize it, but this is one easy way. Okay, so um, the second technique is uh, scheduler parally, uh, parallelism uh, that maps uh, pretty well to the uh, throughput challenge that I was talking about. Again, the traditional approach doesn't offer much in this space other than a few uh, research products that we know of the centralized scheduler uh, is a sort of state of the practice uh, being used in HPC uh, facilities. And uh, uh, it is inherently limited with respect to the number of jobs and resources that it can schedule for obvious reasons. Uh, with the uh, hierarchical design, the Flux uh, brings in ample uh, scheduler parallelism. Uh, and then the scheduler parallelism can be realized as easily as um, you have Flux instances across different allocations each of which um, schedule um, its own sub jobs in it without having to affect the uh, top level top level scheduler. Further, uh, within an allocation, you can um, you can instantiate a deeper levels of um, you know flux instances like this. So in this uh, in this graph, within allocation, you see you have allocation level flux instance. Um, it spawns four uh, flux instances, each of which deals with the uh, uh, node uh, within this uh, allocated uh, resources. And then it then spawns um, many core level schedulers, um, as many as you have cores on the node. So obviously, um, if you uh, deepen the scheduler hierarchy, you get the uh, obvious boost in the parallelism and the performance. So if your jobs are uh, pretty tri trivial, like sleep zero being the most trivial jobs, and you see, um, as you deepen the schedule hierarchy, you get a drastic um, uh, a job throughput uh, improvement, uh, scheduling up to 1 million. But if your jobs are a little bit involved, and then, you know, especially the ones that's uh, pounding on some shared resources, such as memory st stream with the case, um, the, the uh, little bit flatter hierarchy uh, works, um, works better, uh, we found. Um, and then, the, but the point here is uh, Flux provide a capability for you to, um, you know, choose affordable level of scheduler parallelism that you need. And then the uh, third technique is a rich set of uh, well-defined APIs, and this maps well to the job coordination and communication challenge. And jobs in ensemble-based uh, or couple-based simulations often require close coordination and communication uh, with the scheduler as well as amongst themselves. Uh, a traditional CLI-based um, approach uh, can be quite slow to do this job and cumbersome. And then we see uh, a lot of ad hoc approaches uh, that are used to circumvent that uh, limitations, including having to write a lot of small files just to, um, just to pass the status of each job of Ensemble, for example, that can lead to a lot of side effects. A lot of APIs and then 
uh, largely speaking, we have, have two categories of APIs. One is primitives, um, event pops up, and RPC request and reply, send and receive patterns. And then we do provide APIs for our high level services too, which include things like KVS uh, API and Java API and you name it. And if you wanna uh, take a look at those APIs, we have a pretty well uh, you know, documented um, API set. Um, so if you go to this uh, website, uh, read the docs, you will see um, you know, the APIs from uh, false core at least at this point. And then our response to the portability is to provide uh, the um, API set consistently across different platforms. So um, you, um, as a, um, you as a scientist will write your uh, scientific workflow on uh, this API set once and enjoy the portability uh, to the platforms where uh, Flux has been ported. So, but at the same time, that also puts a lot of burdens to the Flux community to port and optimize Flux uh, on as many uh, platforms as, as possible. So we judiciously chose the APIs that we depend upon and uh, we require Linux. And then uh, for single user uh, Flux mode, uh, we require a low level uh, system interface called the uh, process management interface or PMI. So if your HPC system can um, launch a bootstrap on MPI, uh, which makes use of a form of PMI, then you likely to have uh, the API that Flux can use to bootstrap itself too. Okay. So um, I um, uh, spoke at length um, about the Mumi uh, in the beginning. So I thought it makes sense to present how they uh, solve their uh, workflow challenges using, uh, using Flux on Sierra. So like I said, uh, they combine uh, macro scale simulations with the uh, micro uh, scale simulations. Um, and then as the uh, ROS genes are simulated at the membrane level, a uh, machine learning module score uh, the patch on the membrane and um, you know invoke um, actually uh, in queue uh, those most interesting patches as jobs uh, which then gets executed as GPU uh, becomes available and then uh, but the thing is as the uh, uh, macro model proceed the score of those patches constantly change that means that they also need to dequeue some of the jobs if the priority changes. Uh, and then, you know, to hide that complexity, uh, they uh, use the Maestro, um, Maestro workflow manager and uh, how they, um, how they uh, and then they develop a Flux in Maestro adapter to be able to handle the, you know, starting and stopping of those jobs uh, within our location. And then they also specialize the Flux scheduling to do non-node exclusive scheduling so that you could do uh, core level scheduling and GPU level scheduling as needed um, to uh, map those different components across different sets of uh, resources on our location. Uh, and then this is actually, you know, globally how they put different components. So for example, the uh, uh, macro level uh, DDFT continuum based model uh, runs at about 500 nodes of uh, 2000 nodes, um, which uses CPU only. Um, and then, and for example, uh, the uh, MD simulations utilize uh, entire set of GPUs on our location and, and so on and so forth. So if you uh, crack open a, uh, a node, then you will see this, you know, many components are uh, mapped, uh, you know, very sophisticated like this. So the CPU only jobs such as DDFT, the continuum based model and data brokers and, and whatnot are using about 20 cores um, uh, for each of the socket. And then um, each MD simulations are mapped to uh, a GPU of four on Sierra, along with a core that's closest to GPU. Uh, and then in situ data analytics are mapped to some other cores like this. So, um, and then also, uh, you know, those MD simulations uh, expose, uh, they require a pre high throughput, um, high throughput mode. So they utilize two level of flux uh, hierarchy to handle that uh, scalability. So that's why uh, they, they believe that, um, you know, uh, being able to do this with, uh, you know, traditional LSF scheduler and um, loss run was uh, almost next to impossible. So um, here's the summary of the major workflows that uh, Flux has enabled. Um, and uh, Mumi, of course, the ran on our systems um, last few years in production, and then actually won the uh, SC19 best paper award for its uh, innovative um, 
you know, workflow architecture that enable, they said, a, a new genre of uh, cancer research, uh, and then recently upgraded um, to the latest Flux uh, to gear up for their runs uh, on Oak Ridge Summit. And then, uh, you know, Livermore's uncertain quantification pipeline workflow actually refactor its uh, ensemble manager layer uh, around Flux and then produce a component uh, out of UQP that can be used not only by itself, but also by uh, other workflow tools uh, targeting not only UQ, but also uh, BNB um, and parameter and sensitive studies uh, and things like that. And then they demonstrate the uh, um, unify, unifying workflow and system scheduling using Flux uh, can provide significant benefit with respect to uh, performance as well as of their complexity. And then I talked about MLSI, they use Flux to address the throughput challenge. And then the Merlin workflow uh, is the workflow that they created. Um, and then that's got adopted by other community, including uh, COVID-19. And then one thing that happened in the past few months was that um, they, uh, they used this uh, uh, Merlin workflow to support the what if modeling scenario for uh, COVID-19 spread. So one scientist uh, commented that with Flux, uh, they were able to model one scenario with UQ for the entire country in you know, five minutes on a few uh, Sierra nodes. Lassen is an open size Sierra uh, near uh, real time feedback. Um, and uh, uh, now uh, this workflow has been ported to not only uh, Livermore, but also um, Oak Ridge and, and NERSC. So the modeling is um, you know, something like if you close a school two days out of a week, what happens to spread and things like that. And then the um, latest endeavor um, around this is the uh, COVID-19 drug design end-to-end -end workflow where uh, Flux is playing a central role. So here uh, we form a multidisciplinary team uh, to combine Atom, which is a machine learning based drug uh, molecule design framework with the uh, large docking simulations compare LC to expediently produce COVID-19 drug component uh, compounds for uh, further uh, clinical testing. And uh, already at like 256 nodes, uh, Flux um, was shown to improve the resource utilization of docking simulation by a factor of two. And with its API approach, um, it's also showing the benefit uh, when we couple um, co uh, Convair LC with the rest of the uh, drug design pipeline. And then uh, we are putting together a uh, COVID-19 Golden Bell submission for, uh, for this year's supercomputing as well. So what's next? Um, so working with the users last few years, um, I realized there are a lot of uh, workflow manager software systems out there. Even uh, you know, across the uh, DOE complex alone, one survey shows that we have about uh, over 200 some, uh, some tools. And then uh, while each of those tools work very well for uh, their domains, their effectiveness uh, tend to go down when uh, that's applied to, uh, to other, uh, other domains, uh, perhaps more importantly. Um, you know, they are designed as a single tool so that um, they cannot be easily layered and leverage one another. Um, so just like this picture shows, you know, use the right tool for the, for, for the job, you know, this child to start uh, using saw it didn't work. And then, you know, instead of modify somehow, um, he's basically saying, give me another tool, <laughs> hammer. So uh, regarding this, um, uh, Livermore, uh, you know, now, it's not an exception um, th that has been the workflow ecosystem so far. So uh, distinct workflow functionalities um, have been implemented across multiple tools. For example, uh, workflow description uh, was implemented in both UQ pipeline as well as Maestro. And then workflow runtime orchestration um, has been implemented across uh, UQP, Maestro, and Merlin, and uh, HPC resource allocation and scheduling are implemented LS, across LSF, uh, Flux, and Slurm. But ideally, what we really want to do is um, we want to allow users to uh, pick and choose and compose functionalities from uh, multiple tools in a way that's mostly uh, uh, effective um, for, their, for their job. So uh, one might want to just use uh, you know, one, you know, one functionality from Maestro for a workflow description and then use Merlin as a you know, orchestration layer, and then use Flux as the, uh, the portable uh, HPC allocation scheduling layer. So uh, in fact, the LNL teams um, have been collaborating together with a common vision to create a, a sort of plug and play a workflow ecosystem. So um, you know, I believe what Merlin team did um, 
with regard to that uh, was quite instrumental. So uh, when users actually complained about the workflow description interface of Merlin, what they did was they co-designed the uh, description interface with the Merlin and uh, carve out, uh, no, so, so Maestro, sorry, and then carve out Merlin's uh, description uh, interface and you know, plug in Maestro's one, which is a YAML-based and a lot more user-friendly, um, at least um, you know, uh, the, the scientists could understand better. And then, uh, and then use the uh, Merlin itself for the orchestration la layer, and then use Flux as the, uh, um, as the HPC scheduling and allocation layer. Um, the key there is, of course, to define the right APIs and methodology to, um, to be able to create a, a plug-and-play component-based workflow, uh, workflow system. And in that context, um, Flux recently uh, teamed up with uh, two representative workflow manager teams uh, with the goal to uh, define them. And this new project is called the uh, uh, XLWorks project uh, within ECP, uh, which just started, uh, started last month, you know, August, although we had some preparation beforehand. And then we uh, combined forces with the um, you know, parcel workflow team from uh, Argon and radical pilot team from uh, Brookshaven National Lab. Uh, as this uh, figure shows, each of those tools provide pretty good components within and uh, interfaces as well. So that can serve uh, us as the sort of good starting point. And um, as part of this project, we'll co-design um, you know, requisite interfaces, uh, both vertically as well as horizontally. And then while we are uh, while engaging a wider uh, range of HPC communities, ranging from um, you know, DOE HPC facilities to ECP software teams to other uh, workflow management um, software teams and, and what have you. Um, so uh, once design is uh, done, then uh, we're going to provide our uh, hardened reference implementation uh, called the Exa, ExaWorks uh, tool, toolbox and then deploy that on, um, you know, on ExaScale systems for you to use. Um, so, um, so I started like three minutes uh, after. So I want to spend a little bit more time before I uh, give a torch to uh, Stephen. Hopefully that's okay. Um, so, so I'll talk briefly about how uh, Flux addressed the other main scheduling problem, uh, which is called the resource challenge. So this challenge arises as more diverse set of uh, compute and other resources are coming to our way. So unless our schedulers can consider them as uh, additional constraint, the system um, can run a risk of performance losses, uh, both at the system as well as uh, workflow levels. So uh, from my perspective, this problem really goes back to the simplicity um, resource model that the traditional approach like Swarm, PBS Pro, LSF use. Um, they were designed 20 plus years ago. Um, and you know, when our HPC systems were uh, much simpler, uh, more or less a homogeneous set of compute nodes. Uh, and then, um, so they, they used a, a relatively simple data model um, to optimize their scheduling. But then, um, but then we believe that their model uh, is at this point outpaced by the, the level of resource diversity that we see. And instead, Flux uses a graph-based model. Um, and uh, each vertex in our graph represent a resource. And each edge um, represent the relationship between uh, connecting vertices. For example, in this case, a cluster is modeled as a resource. And a rack is modeled as a resource um, you know, uh, in the same way that we model compute core and compute node as a resource. Uh, and with this graph, we can actually uh, add additional constraint like rack level, uh, locality constraint, and, and in cluster cluster uh, on what have you. So it turned out um, it's been uh, pretty effective. So uh, our graph-based model has a lot of uh, traction and fluxion is our uh, you know, graph-based scheduler that embodies the model. Uh, and then uh, we are deeply engaging with the HPE uh, in particular to co-design their uh, multi-tier storage system for exascale. And uh, we basically demonstrate that our graph model work basically out of box to be able to express the the type of uh, uh, you know, storage locality that uh, they need to uh, express. And this is something that um, you know, uh, uh, folks like Swarm uh, deem as too difficult. So uh, we felt pretty good about it. And uh, Flux is also driving our interactions with the cloud computing players too. So IBM TJ Watson um, you know, create a prototype called 
Kube blocks to uh, use Fluxion to build HPC scheduling policies into Kubernetes. And uh, recently, uh, Red Hat OpenShift team also came to us expressing their interest to use Fluxion and Flux to uh, define Kubernetes standard scheduler uh, interface. And they said it's, it's becoming important as their commercial um, customers um, are, uh, you know, have workloads that need to pay attention to HPC as well, high performance, you know, performance critical. Um, so overall, this partnership will strengthen uh, the Flux's position with respect to all four tenets of how we envision to embrace HPC uh, plus cloud. Uh, but uh, for interest time, I'm going to stop it here. Um, and uh, uh, for those who are interested in our directions, uh, we're going to have our talk at Supercomputing 20 as part of uh, state of the practice, uh, November 17th, but we don't have the actual time slot, yeah. So if you're interested in drop me a line, then um, I'll send you the the link um, as um, as the schedule uh, gets formed up. So that's all I have. Um, and then, and while I'm giving a torch to Stephen, if you have uh, one or two quick questions, um, please raise it. Hey, um, this is Shane. Uh, that was a Great introduction. I had a couple of questions. Um, one, I'm, I'm kind of curious about, can you talk about the scheduling policy sort of sophistication level at this point in Flux? How does it, it's, it's unclear to me if these subclusters that get created or subschedulers, are those generally fixed things or can they dynamically kind of resize themselves? Well, so there's two things, right? So you can pick and choose uh, what scheduling policy you want statically, right? So so you can choose different queuing policies like, you know, first come first serve or, uh, you know, different kind of backfill scheduling, you know, from conservative backfill to hybrid to easy. Um, and then you can also change uh, match policies, right? Sometimes this match works better and sometimes other matches work better and you can actually uh, write the match policies and then put that into the scheduler uh, and the hierarchical policy. And a match policy will route it to another subscheduler. Is that what? Yeah. So if you create your own Flux instance, you can have a different yeah. policy within it, right? So okay. um, the same is working for, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's what they do it. And then there's a different thing about um, elastic scheduling, right? So that's a big topic mm -hmm. for, um, you know, as we embrace more clouds, and uh, we actually mm -hmm. have a, a researcher who's working on it, and that topic will be um, covered uh, to some extent during the supercomputing, um, supercomputing state, of the, uh, state of the practice talk. Okay. Are there any other questions? So this yeah, is uh, Rami Lehi from uh, Berkeley Lab. Um, one question is within ECP, there's another project called Lib Ensemble, which I think overlaps with some parts of uh, Flux. And uh, could you talk about the relationship between uh, ExaWorks and uh, Lib Ensemble? Is, is that going to be part of it? Yeah, we have been talking with Lib Ensemble and um, so, one area, one potential collaboration area uh, between Lib Ensemble and uh, Excel Works is that as we create a component, is it possible to carve out something from Lib Ensemble and plug in, you know, some Excel Works component in it, right? Um, but with respect to Flux and uh, Lib Ensemble, we kind of, you know, sketch uh, how uh, those two tools can leverage with one another at a supercomputing. Uh, you know, uh, I, I talk with people like uh, Swan um, and, uh, and, and those guys about it. Uh, we talk about it and we have some good ske sketch, but uh, uh, we haven't followed up yet. Okay, thanks. So how, how fine grains can you make the, uh, the jobs and the queues that are set up? Uh, could you be a little bit more specific on that question? Uh, well, so if I wanted to create a um, if I wanted to create a job for every let's say for every process I wanted to execute in a in while I was doing a um, a parallel build, would that be would this be the appropriate tool for that? You can you can do that. In fact, there was a researcher who wanted to do that, and we actually did some uh, back of the envelope calculation about you know uh, can we actually do better than what they use? They basically use a GNU make uh, as a way to do that, and then a back of the calculate. Uh, um, calculation was that uh, with, with respect to that particular workload, we couldn't do that uh, because of the overhead of Python, like, a, you know, uh, Flux Mini Run and things like that. But um, uh, if this is a uh, um, 
kind of significant enough um, uh, use case, we can think of ways to specialize our execution engine in such a way that we strip out some you know, heavy weightness from the execution engine um, so that um, you, can, you can do that. So with a scheduler, um, you're not gonna you know, over schedule uh, or under schedule um, your resources, right? But with the uh, parallel build and make, um, you can easily lead to over scheduling. So, so um, you know, with a you know av avoidance of over scheduling, we gain some performance. But with the you know uh, uh, like overhead coming from Python and things like that, you add some. So uh, we are on par. But uh, as, you know, if we add more thing to uh, 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 service specialization, I'm sure uh, we can actually do uh, uh, do better. So maybe uh, um, at this point, uh, we should give a torch to uh, Stephen to demo on Corey. And then we can circle back to Q&A afterwards. Sure, can you hear me? All right, looks like uh, Zoom is responding. So uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Let me know if the font's not big enough. Um, I can switch to a different terminal. Um, so, right, so this is running on, uh, starting out on a login node of Cori, and it's just using the, the basic default modules so all the Cray stuff is loaded. No need to mess with any of that if you don't want to. Um, but what we will do is we will pull in the module files for Flux that we have installed in global common software. And then we'll go ahead and do a load of one of our dependencies, CZMQ and Flux. And shout out to Brandon Cook for getting us the packages installed so that this was much simpler and cleaner. Uh, so we now have our environment set up. You can see Flux is in the path. And now we can move on to getting allocation Smurn. So this is a demonstration of the single user mode that Dong referred to, where we're going to get the nodes from Slurm and then bootstrap Flux within that. So we'll just grab two nodes. There'll be Haswell for this demonstration, but it also works just fine on Knight's Landing. It'll just be a different number of cores per node, obviously. And then we'll grab an interactive session. So then we're going to do an S run like Dong showed. And Flux is going to bootstrap just like MPI would using the PMI interface. And then we can do a quick sanity check where we'll ask Flux, uh, what resources did you auto detect using the HW lock library? Uh, and we can see that it found both nodes. It found all 64 cores across those two nodes, as well as the hardware threads. And so now that we have our little Flux cluster that's spun up in single user mode, we can start walking through the CLI basics. So the simplest thing you can do in Flux is uh, through the Flux mini command. So it has a couple of sub commands, one of which is run. So we'll do Flux mini run. You can see this is kind of modeled after Slurm. We try and keep the arguments relatively the same. So we'll do uh, two nodes, two tasks across those two nodes. And you'll see we got two different host names because it ran in parallel. We can tweak that and say, hey, let's run host name eight times. And we'll get eight outputs, uh, four from each node. And if we run the help, you can see there's a whole bunch of options you can pass to it. You can ask for GPUs. You can ask for standard out and standard error to be labeled with the rank that it came from. You can redirect standard out and standard error to a file. You can manipulate environment variables, all that fun stuff. So if we do a flux jobs, we get our job listing. No jobs are running. So we have to do dash A, and we'll see the jobs that ran in the past. And you can see that we have our two host names. Because they ran successfully, they're nice and green. So the other command you can do is flux mini submit. And the difference between run and submit is submit just immediately shoots the job off in the background to run, returns the job ID, doesn't block waiting for output. Uh, so you can see it's running in the background right now. And that's going to run forever. So we can kill that off by pasting in the job ID. And we'll see that because we killed it off, it had a negative exit code. And so now it's, it's red in the job listing with a uh, failed status. So then the, the third type of mini subcommand is flux mini batch. And so this is very similar to what uh, you're probably used to with uh, Slurm with S batch and S run. So we have a, a MPI hello script and an MPI hello world binary. And if we dump the contents of that script, it's just a simple bash script that's doing some module swaps and then doing a flux mini run of that MPI binary. So again, this is really similar to if you would do S batch on that script and have an S run inside. We also support that sort of flux mini batch with the script and then a flux mini run inside. And what's actually happening under the hood is flux mini batch will create a nested flux instance for you and then run that script inside that nested instance. 
And so if we do a flux jobs listing, uh, you'll see that it uh, set the name to the, the bash script uh, and then it started across the two nodes. And it says there's only two tasks because that's the instance. There's only two tasks in that instance, but then inside of the instance, there's gonna be a, a task running that has 64 ranks. And something else that Flux Mini Batch does by default is it actually uh, redirects the standard out to a file. So now that it's completed, uh, we can check and see that, okay, it completed successfully. And we can look at the file system to see there's our dot out file. We can uh, peek at that to see that all 64 ranks reported something and they did. Uh, and then we can actually peek at the top of it to see the contents. And yeah, it's working just fine. MPI was able to bootstrap and uh, print out the ranks. So take a little detour into the, what's underpinning all of this. Uh, it's a thing we call Flux Job Spec. So when you run Flux Mini anything, uh, under the hood, what it's doing is it's generating what we call Job Spec, which is a YAML file that describes exactly what you want to run. So here's the JSON form of uh, our Sleep Zero example. And so you can see here, up at the top are the resources that are being requested. We're asking for a, a task slot with a single core inside of it. And then we're asking that a sleep zero command be run inside of that slot. And then we have some metadata about the job, like the current working directory, how long we requested zero meaning infinite. And then we stripped out the environment with env remove just so it fit on the screen. Uh, but you would see all the environment variables there uh, if we didn't do that. And then we can tweak this. We can ask for two nodes and multiple tasks. And you'll see that the node resource now pops up there. And, and the number of slots is, has gone up to four per node. Uh, this is a multiplicative. So not that you ever really need to generate any of this, but just want to kind of give you a peek into what's happening under the hood. You can see the GPUs now pop up. Um, one of the really cool things about having this file be generated is that it's stored in Flux's key value store. And so you can actually go back and grab the job spec that was used for any job that was submitted in the past. So we can grab our mini batch job, the uh, F2KCG, paste that in and say flux job info, job ID, job spec. And so that'll dump the job spec that was used to run that job. Uh, so here you can see the resources kind of fell off the screen, but in the attributes, you'll see that the standard out was requested to be redirected to a file. You'll also see uh, here the batch script that we asked to run was read in and stored in the job spec. So now you have full provenance of your job, exactly what the script was that was being run uh, and what resources were requested for it. You can also grab what we call R, which is the concrete set of resources that the job ran on. And so for that mini batch job, uh, we ran on both nodes and all 32 cores. If we pick one of the smaller jobs, uh, you'll see the, the it's limited to a subset of cores. And so this is really nice if uh, you want to see, uh, you know, oh, we had a, a run that was slow. Maybe it was the nodes that we were given that were acting up, or we had a, we had this one job crash out of a big ensemble. Could it have been the resources that it ran on? Um, there's, a, there's a whole lot of things you can do with that information. All right, but off that rabbit trail on to uh, the Python API. So as Dong mentioned, we have this really nice Python API as an alternative to our CLI. Um, and we have an example in uh, the Flux framework organization on GitHub. We have these Flux workflow examples. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I encourage you to check them out. The one I wanted to highlight was the async bulk job submit. And so in this, we have uh, just a simple Python script. And at the top, all it's doing is it's going to iterate over the arguments that we pass in, read them in as files. Uh, and it's going to assume that there's job spec JSON in there and just pass that J, uh, JSON through to the scheduler through the submit async interface. Um, and so all that's kind of happening right now is the tutorial, the demo is just creating a, a sample job spec to submit. Um, so if we continue looking at the code, there's an asynchronous submission. It uses features inside of Flux with reactive programming. So this callback will be run once that job is submitted. And then we just enter a, a while loop waiting for jobs to complete. Um, so we went ahead and copied that job spec 511 times. So now the script is gonna read each one of those JSON files, submit them off, and then wait for them all to complete. And we'll get a nice little progress bar as those jobs finish. So it's, it's a really simple example of just submitting a job. 
uh, the point is just to illustrate that we do have a, a Python API that you can do a lot of things with. You can submit jobs, you can query their status, you can wait on their status, uh, you can cancel them, you can access the key value store, uh, submit messages, submit events. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do uh, from Python. So going into the scheduler specialization that Dong was talking about, we have a little demo here of we're going to submit a one node job that runs for an hour. And then we're going to submit some larger jobs and show how the first come first serve can uh, have an effect. So we see that our one node job just ran perfectly fine. We're going to submit a two node job, which we expect won't run immediately because we only have two nodes. Uh, and one job is sucking up one of them currently. And then we'll submit another one node job. And we would anticipate that this would run, but because by default Flux uses first come first serve, it's actually going to be blocked by that two node job. And so what we can do now is we can actually reload our queue manager module uh, with a different uh, queuing policy. So let's really quick actually just show you the modules that are load flux. And so as Don was saying, these are all modular sort of microservices that collectively make up flux. And you can see that we have a key value store and a resource and a job manager. And the one that we're going to be reloading is this sched fluxy and queue manager. So we're going to go ahead and unload that. It won't kill any jobs, it'll all continue running. Um, and then we will uh, reload it, but this time we will use a queue policy of easy backfilling, which will allow jobs to run out of order as long as they don't delay the, the, top, the job at the top. And so what's happening right now is the uh, job manager is replaying the jobs to the scheduler and it's sort of rerunning its scheduling loop and reevaluating them. And then when we check the jobs again, our uh, third job has now started running because it was allowed to via the backfilling. So just sort of a simple example of how you can reload things within your single user scheduler to meet the exact needs that you have. There's a whole lot of knobs you can tweak and tune, uh, and they're all available for your uh, adjustment. So uh, let's go ahead and cancel all of those jobs, get a clean slate. And then we can move on to high throughput via hierarchical scheduling. So as Dong mentioned, one of the key things that Flux has is it can nest itself. And so we have a little utility called Flux Tree that makes it easy for you to spin up those hierarchies and distribute jobs across them, rather than having to use a whole set of scripts and mini batch and stuff. So we uh, type out Flux Tree, tell it to use two nodes and 32 cores per node. And then that capital T is the topology. So we're asking it to create eight subschedulers underneath the current one. And then we're asking it to do 512 jobs across those eight. And our job is just flux mini submit sleep zero. And so that'll run um, due to the, we, I think we sped this up in the recording, so it, it shouldn't take the full 20 some seconds, but um, yep, there it goes. The, the other thing you can do with tree is that, uh, oh, sorry, because uh, we spun up sub instances, you'll see those being recorded as the jobs. You see the eight uh, flux tree instances rather than 512 sleeps. Uh, so the other thing you can do is you can actually spin up multiple levels. And so we can do uh, two schedulers underneath the current one and then eight below those. We can also quickly customize the queuing policy to be easier first come first serve. We can customize the parameters that are passed to the, the uh, queuing manager, including the queue depth or the match policy. Uh, all of these things are customizable pretty easily. Um, and then finally, what we can do is you can actually customize the queuing policy and the parameters per level. So you could say like easy at the two level and then first come first serve at that leaf eight level uh, within the flux tree utility. So just a, a nice little script to make it easy to, to take advantage of that hierarchical scheduling. And so with that, I will turn it back over for Q&A. Yeah, so there have been a lot of questions um, in the chat room while, Stephen, you are driving your demo. Um, I believe I um, addressed most of them. And um, are there uh, uh, more questions beyond the uh, questions asked in the chat room at this point? Yeah, I had one that I was curious about. Is it possible to, it's kind of a, maybe similar to the question asked earlier, 
is it possible to pers persistently sort of start a flux manager and then dynamically start slurm jobs that could add or remove uh, nodes into that flux environment? Yeah, so, um, so our design actually, uh, uh, we, we design our protocols to support elastic uh, growth and uh, shrink like that. Uh -huh. And then uh, we uh, implemented uh, the partial functionality of that. And in, in our design, we have a way to do that. Um, it just has not been um, the focus for us yet, right? Our current focus is to make sure um, some of the advanced workflow can be, um, can be run effectively in uh, production. And then uh, next, uh, the making our uh, you know, system instance, um, you know, the system instance of our Linux systems. And then probably in two years down the road, um, you'll start to see more elastic scheduling and uh, dynamic uh, resizing uh, you know, uh, popping up in our production, production software. Uh, we, we have developed our software stack for a while, uh, but you know, with a large project like this, uh, we have to have a uh, sense of priorities. Um, and then uh, definitely uh, with the cloud and you know, elastic workloads, I see that uh, dynamic resizing will be a big part of uh, what we're gonna need to support. In the yeah, there's a, a more immediate use case that even kind of without the cloud kind of model where you know, we might have a workflow engine that needs to submit things in and then you know, that's running continuously and then we add, add resources sort of over time based on how much is queued up or something like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. maybe there's other ways to achieve it though. Yeah, I mean, so um, yeah, we, our graph approach should be um, kind of flexible enough to accommodate that. Uh, in fact, uh,